Our next speaker is uh, Sun Hung Park. Uh, we call him Sean. He's anglicized his name. Sean is uh, the largest uh, implanter of penile implants uh, in Asia and has a, his clinic in Seoul, Korea, uh, where he does all his uh, implants under local. Uh, Sean has been one of the pioneers of the new subcoronal incision. You know, this operation of penile prosthesis has been around for more than 40 years, and here we have a, a new incisional approach, and Sean has been one of the pioneers of it. So, Sean, if you'll come and give us a paragraph about why you like this particular approach. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So, almost all my virgin patients are done under local anesthesia. When I tried the uh, local anesthesia with the scrotal approach, after I injected those local anesthetics, the scrotum, surgical planes are kind of obliterated, so it's hard to really find where the dartos layers were. So, after I converted the subcronal approach, since the uh, plane is quite different, uh, it is much feasible with the local anesthesia. The second problem, the second part is that uh, after you do the subcoronal approach, you, well, one really don't have to worry about the post-operative hematoma. When it comes to the post-operative hematoma after the scrotal approach or either a penile infrapubic approach, when the incisions break down and the bleeding comes out, there's kind of emergency. But with the subcoronal approach, one doesn't have to really worry about that. So coronal inflatable penile prostate surgery under local anesthesia with modified Olsen's deeper maneuver. Stepwise injection of local anesthetics during the surgery will minimize patient discomfort. Before the incision, to the unknown penile root inguinal canal block is done. Adding local just before listed steps demonstrated during the video could maximize the anesthesia. So coronal approach is quite similar to scrotal approach. These key points shown in this video clip could help preventing surgical complications like crossover during the dilation, post-operative scrotal tubing protrusion, or penile edema. Preoperative trimix was injected for corporal relaxation. Local anesthesia starts with bilateral trend block, then conventional penile root block, then direct ring in a ring block. After identifying the right inguinal canal through the scrotum, needle was introduced to the ring guided by right index finger. Dream utility drape was applied to prevent sucking. Circumferential subcoronal incision was done. Dartos fascia was dissected with mosquito clamp. Since there are two dartos layers, care was taken for complete dissection of each layer. Gentle penile degloving was done. Right proximal corpora was exposed with step-by-step -step method. After adding local anesthesia, dissection with gauze and baby charcoal was carried out until ischiocavernous muscle is exposed. Left proximal corpora space was developed with same method. Scrotal septum was dissected with modified Wilson's diver maneuver to prevent post-operative tubing protrusion. Each diver was placed with gentle traction, which helps demarcating scrotal septum. After adding local anesthesia, sharp dissection was carried out. This maneuver helps identify scrotal septum, thus makes dissection much quicker and safer. As shown, scrotal septum is fully dissected and it also gives better view of the proximal corpora. Right corpora stage suture was done with Vicor 20 UR6, where corpora is bent. If it's too proximal, distal dilation will be quite difficult due to the angulation. If too distal, tubing may cause patient discomfort after the surgery. After adding 2 ml of local anesthesia to proximal corpora, incision about 1.5 cm was done with 15 blade. Proximal corpora was dilated and measured with firm lobe inserter. Distal corpora was also dilated and measured with follow inserter. 
When dilating distal corpora, penile axis should be aligned to prevent crossover. Same was done to left side, and cylinders and reservoir were prepared according to the measurement. Reservoir was placed at right rectus space. If patient feels pain at this point, local anesthesia can be added under the direct vision. As prosthesis could be prepared only after the measurement, and it takes less time to prepare the reservoir, placing it ahead of cylinders to save time. Reservoir was filled with cell line accordingly. Left cylinder was placed with follow inserter. With gentle traction by Baby Charleston, it's quite similar to scroll approach. Stay suture was tied and cut. Same was done to the right side. Tubing was trimmed down and connection was made. Pump was placed to mid scrotum. Testing was done before the closure. Arthos fascia was marked with mosquito clad for meticulous repair. Jackson Pratt drain was placed. Continuous suture with Viper 30 was done to repair the Arthos layer. Skin was repaired continuously with nylon 50 separately from the Tartos patient. Compression dressing was applied for a day. So actually in April of 2015, uh, our Federal Drug Administration, known as the FDA, approved uh, placement of the Coloplast Reservoir in an ectopic or high submuscular location. So in our country, it's perfectly legit and no longer considered uh, off-label. So we're going to stop right here, and this will give you an opportunity to uh, address any questions that you might have had from the previous seven videos. And while you're thinking of your questions, I'm going to give the faculty uh, an opportunity to uh, comment on anything they'd like to say. I think, David Ralph, uh, didn't you have a comment you wish to say? I just really wanted to ask Sean how much is safe. Uh, you're using a lot of lidocaine, lidocaine. How much is safe and what, what volumes? Because a lot of these patients are cardiac patients. I mean, I get asked to put in at the moment a local anesthetic when the anaesthetist says, this guy is not fit. And you have to know the how, what quantity of local anaesthetic you're going to use. So... Because you're using a lot. Yeah, I'm using a lot. Right, so I'm using less than 35 cc's per case. In general, uh, that's the reason why I'm using a 1% lidocaine and 0.5% lidocaine. Nowadays, I'm trying to use uh, rather than profibacaine to the raw pivacaine. There's a lower, uh, which is lower cardiac toxicity. So those can be of good help. Uh, these days I also add a phantom citrate, an amplobit, which traditionally we believe that only works well with the uh, CNS blocks, but it turns out that it has a pretty good effect on the peripheral nervous system as well. So my patient usually don't need the narcotics for a personal protein, I mean pain. They go home the same day? They go home at the same day and come back tomorrow morning for the dress. Uh, any other questions or comments from, from our board? Any comments or questions from the audience? Oh, wonderful. So, we, I got one. Yes. Do you think, I mean, I like the way that you, your video with the ectopic and then as well as with the laparoscope looking up. Do you think that should be common practice with the ectopic placement? 
because I've got a feeling that in the years to come, we're going to see a lot of intra-abdominal reservoirs, and I already have seen a lot of very subcutaneous reservoirs, um, because presumably when you look down, you should see the muscle belly anterior to you. One, one thing that I have not put in that video and needs to be stressed is that uh, you have, when you're palpating the pubic tubercle, you have to keep pushing on it until you get it squeaky clean. So there's no, no, no fascia, no scarpus fascia, no nothing. You feel the actual nodule of the, of the pubic tubercle. And if you do that, that means that you're going to get it posterior to all the uh, muscles of the abdomen and the interior to the transversalis. And I think you're right, David. Early on when I started doing it, I had a lot of subcutaneous ones too because I wasn't getting deep enough. And the way to get deep enough is to clean the pubic tubercle completely clean. And then when you put, put your clamp in, you just go in like that and up toward the head. We initially uh, used to uh, describe it as passing the clamp toward the ipsilateral shoulder, but that also gave us a lot of sub-Q uh, reservoirs that were palpable. And so now we say, pass the clamp toward the head. But do you, do you, have you abandoned your original approach? What about the very thin patient? You talking about really thin patient, yeah, you th know he's going to no, feel no, the, the thin, reservoir. The thin patient, you gotta, you got to tell him he's going to feel it. Uh, but it and you probably would want, if it were me, I would go back to the traditional intraperitoneal on a thin patient. But, uh, you know, people feel uh, inner stems and pacemakers and stuff like that. So if you warn them that they're going to feel it, uh, it doesn't bother them. Okay, first question. I'm Dr. Rana from India. Actually, I want to ask about the putting IPP in the patient who has small phallus post epispedias and extrophy repair. Are you talking about in, in patients that have had a phalloplasty for that condition? Not phalloplasty, they have small phallus with ED and other processes well, in these patients. Well, these are just going to be patients, normal IPPs, but you're going to have to use a smaller model. The trouble with these groups of patients, uh, the epispadiate patients, is that they're going to have a core D. So you really do have to make an assessment because you're not going to be able to straighten that penis by either incision modeling uh, anything on the shorter side because you're limited by the neurovascular bundle. So you have to, I mean, they have to have a good sized penis if you're going to do that. But there's no difference. Clearly in these patients, a lot of them are going to have had multiple operations, a trophonophs, etc. And you probably want to do an open reservoir placement in that, in that patient. If you are just mentioning about the small penis, I would like to say about something about you. We all, we usually regard, uh, Asians have a very small penis. But I want to stress out that the usual size of my cylinder is 18 or 20 centimeters, which is pretty similar to the US size. So uh, before the surgery, I think that for the Asian patients who looks like have a small penis, uh, preoperative uh, corporal relaxation with either with uh, artificial erection with the cell and or trimix is very important so we can we don't we don't undersize the actual size of the cylinder that's what I'm thinking. Thank you. Yes sir. As regards the ectopic placement of the reservoir, what are the essence of complications like infection, like hematoma, like erosion into the peritoneum? And what are the solutions if you develop the infection? Is it easy to remove the reservoir or not? Dr. Pareto? This is going back and um, actually addressing what Dr. Ralph asked as, what, as well as you're, you're asking. If you look at patients with low BMIs and smokers, and this is an abstract that will be presented at the SMS, you'll, you'll find that you're going to have a higher incidence of migration into the peritoneum. When I say higher incidence, it's two out of several thousand, although we don't know if there's others out there. The transversalis is very, very thin in these patients with low BMIs and smokers. So, as you were referring to before, David, uh, it, well, I'm sure we're going to see a higher incidence of reservoirs that might have migrated into the peritoneum. Um, as far as higher infection rates, no, there doesn't appear to be any of those. As far as bowel bladder vascular injuries, I mean, the reason we're placing them 
isomuscular, whatever language you want to use. And I like Alan's language because it emphasizes to keep it medial and high. Uh, you're not going to have any increase in bowel bladder bad vascular. The only reason that I don't is that top it on every, or, or isomuscular, whatever you want to call it, is because it hurts. It's very painful for the patient for about two to three weeks. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it, there truly is no other reason other than now this, this, this possible new delayed presentation of migration into the peritoneum. And that abstract will be at the SMS this year. Could, could the uh, AV people put up the second 1B? Okay, Mohammed, you can give us a Dr. Hasbos from, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question to the infrabibic approach, how easy can we access the distal corpora if we find uh, severe fibrosis, erroneous disease, and some plagues? Because the usual classic approach for scrotal or being scrotal, we can extend and go and maybe under vision we can remove the blacks or something like this. So, my question to the two experts who uh, presented the infrapubic approach, how easy can this can be done? As you're going to see in a little bit, that, that in Mount Miami we approach these plaques through something called the scratch. But, and when doing this internal disruption of plaques uh, via the scratch, we use a nasal speculum to gain access to the penis. We actually have in our hospital 140 millimeter nasal speculums to gain access to the end of the penis. So is this can be done blindly. Blindly, as, you, as you'll see coming up in one of the videos coming up in a little bit. That that would be the internal disruption of uh, a plaque. Now, do you guys do a degloving or anything? Yes. So I mean, there are certain steps you can use. Uh, as he was mentioning, the scratch technique. Rosello dilators can also disrupt the plaque internally. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wilson has got a double-sided scissor that can also be used for that. But for patients for which there is still problems distally, um, you can close the wound once it's in and then you can actually do a counter-incision, a deglove incision, occasionally, uh, 